Thank you, Richard and Juanita for inviting me. And this is a talk that's dear to my heart and I've been giving it, I'm on the circuit now, right now. Um, so uh, happy to tell the story to you guys. Um, and I pose the question, why are we into native plants? I mean, sure you have your various reasons. And I'll just tell you in my career, um, I've been into them for different reasons. When I was an entomology student, um, it's because there were no pesticides would be needed. You would, they would have some insects on them, but they would, nothing would be pesty. I was into biological control of, of weeds, excuse me, of uh, pests back then. And I was a member of the California Native Plant Society back then. Um, and then I had a chance to work in water conservation. <clears throat> so the reason to plant natives would be if you put the pl right plant in the right place, you'll need water only for establishment. This is part of my landscape in, in Longwood. And now my reason for being into natives is completely for the birds. Because the sad figure that I'm sure you've heard, 2.9 billion birds have disappeared over the past 50 years. And uh, this is based on a wide spectrum of studies. So over a 50 year period, uh, birds are down 30%, mostly due to habitat loss. So here we go with my talk, Plants for Birds, a Caterpillar Connection. And the way this is gonna lay out, um, I'll first talk about the birds, then the caterpillars, and finally the plants that are best for the caterpillars. Well, fall and spring migration are exciting times of the year. And Orange Audubon has bird walks at Mead Botanic Garden in Winter Park, which is kind of a migrant hotspot. And here we are, I think, in a spring migration trip before COVID, of course. And we're looking up. And what birds do many birders like best? Songbirds, the uh, vireos, tanagers, buntings. And best of all, we like the warblers. Gorgeous little songbirds, of which there are 37 species in the Eastern United States that pass through Florida going north or south to the tropics. Only a very few breed here. And um, our warblers are thought to be originally tropical. And what's the evidence for that? That they spend two thirds of the year in the tropics and that there are many other species of tropical warblers. So they're coming north and south twice a year and it's very dangerous. So I'm gonna to try to establish why they would do that, how they do it and why they would do that. Well, how is that they navigate by the stars and they go at night um, when it, the air is less turbulent and also hawks, raptors, which need uh, the daylight and the, and the thermals to, to, to fly. Um, those are not out at night. Many species winter in the Caribbean and those don't have that far to, to fly, like from Cuba to Florida and then up the coast to the Eastern United States where they breed like this black throated blue. Um, but those that breed in, excuse me, winter in uh, Northern South America or Central America or, or uh, over here, they have a choice, which, which each species has made uh, over, over evolutionary time. Um, they either cross the Gulf or they have to go on land and they're crossing a major desert. The trans-Gulf migrants hitting storms fall on oil rigs or ships or mostly just right into the water and die. And the Sergum Gulf migrants must cross the largest desert in North America, the Chihuahuan Desert. So this is a big challenge. And what's the reward for the risk of these dangerous flights? It is the leafing out of the Eastern forests, Eastern deciduous forests and caterpillars feeding on the new leaves. Caterpillars that are the larvae of small moths, Micro lepidoptera. These are soft bodied and perfect food for nestlings. 
And they have exoskeletons like all insects, but they're soft. And they're easy for a warbler with its sharp little beak to pick them out and stuff them down the nestling's gullet. So this is what they feed on, caterpillars. They're rich in carotenoids, and this is something I learned from Doug Tallamy's books, which may contribute to the bright colors of adult warblers. And uh, this is actually the, the, an adult moth that's getting fed, but anyway, that they, they're the perfect size to feed for the nestlings. So songbird migration is timed with spring leafing out of the deciduous forest. How do I know this? I've read this book more than once. Living on the Wind Across the Hemisphere with Migratory Birds by Scott Weidensall. A brilliant book from 2000 that was a Pulitzer Prize finalist, which is unheard of for a bird book to make it on the nonfiction competition for the Pulitzer Prize, but he did. And uh, anyway, this tells this whole story of migration. Now, Scott has a new book as of, of about a year out, um, A World on the Wing. Um, and uh, Orange Audubon is actually having him speak for us on YouTube Live um, this coming Thursday. And you're all welcome to tune into that. And uh, he, he, it'll only be on posted on YouTube for about a month. So, um, you know, catch it either that night or check it out early. So the caterpillar hatch is timed with emergence of the new leaves of the deciduous trees. So which stage of the caterpillar um, moth overwinters? You've got your egg, larvae, pupae, or adult. And by the way, this is the California oak moth that I my thesis was perfectly related to. Um, well, it's mostly the pupa that's the tough tough, most protected stage. For instance, um, the gypsy moth. So here's the cocoon, the pupae, and the adult comes out in earliest spring, lays the eggs, and then the caterpillars feed. That's the usual cycle. It's possible that the eggs could be laid in the bark and the cracks in the bark and over winter. I suppose it's even possible that the um, adult could overwinter, but it's usually the pupae. Pupa. Mm -hmm. So not only deciduous trees, but conifers have new growth in caterpillars. So to review all this, warblers and other songbirds need caterpillars to feed their young. And this picture of black and white feeding on a caterpillar is taken at Fort DeSoto Park in April. So it shows that they'll also eat the caterpillars for their own sustenance. But the main point is that they need a lot of caterpillars to feed their young to get a brood through. And everybody knows that in winter in a migration, berries and seeds sustain birds. Of course, you've got your American Beauty berries, a staple of our native plant landscapes. Um, but because the birds are down so much, um, forests have decreased since the earliest European settlers came to the new world with tools um, able to rapidly cut the forest. And um, in the Amazon, we know that they're cutting the forest and not only cutting, but also fires are occurring. So this is losing this caterpillar habitat, caterpillar food. So what can you do to help songbirds? Plant the best trees for caterpillars, in addition to trees and shrubs with berries. Learn to live with caterpillar damage on your plants. Use no pesticides. And reduce your lawn and change the palette of plants in your yard to plants that foster caterpillars, the native plants of your area. And if you uh, are thinking ahead and think, wow, this sounds a lot like Doug Tallamy's work. Well, it largely is. I've been very inspired by him, um, his original book, Bringing Nature Home, and then Nature's Best Hope. As a matter of fact, Nature's Best Hope is what really got me on the lecture circuit here because he says in it, only 5% of the US is in parks and preserves. 41% is in agriculture, but it's mostly monoculture, not conducive habitat for the birds. 
and 54% is urban suburban. So he says that's the part that we have to attack and create our homegrown national park and do our plants for birds things in our own yards. And he says that it's not enough to just quietly grow your own native plants. You've got to teach about it and get your neighbors to do it and create that homegrown national park. So that's what I'm saying is he got me going on this out of my shyness and, and presenting. Now he has some good tips about moths uh, to turn off outdoor lights when not in use and add motion sensors to security lights and install yellow bulbs that were, they're better than the white bulbs for the moths to, to not attract the moths. And if we all did this, he says, we would save billions of moths and other beneficial insects each year. So you may be wondering, how do you identify Microlepidoptera caterpillars? Well, this is my friend, Julieta Brabilia, who is the person at the um, Division of Plant Industry in Gainesville, Florida De Department of Agriculture and Consumer Science is there. Um, she receives any submissions of insects to identify and she farms them out to the specialists. So um, that's what you have to do. You have to rear the caterpillars and get the adults and send them in. This, um, I was looking for a picture of rearing the caterpillars and this popped up. That's my major professor, Dr. Jerry Powell from UC Berkeley. And um, by the way, the book, Caterpillars of Eastern North America by Dave Wagner is a good reference. And Dave Wagner was a student of my Dr. Powell. Um, but it's, it's a lot of work. You, let's say you see one tree with a lot of caterpillars and you wanna know what they are. So you collect a bunch of them enough that you have multiples and take some of the leaves, put it in a plastic bag, let them feed, replenish the leaves, try to not get any moisture in there and um, get them through so that they pupate and come out adults. And then you've got to pin them and then you've got to send them to Gainesville. And uh, I know uh, my, my attempt at that uh, was not very successful. So I, I, I don't even try to do that. Um, but I, will, I encourage anybody who, who gets the interest to do that. And uh, Julieta will make sure they get it identified. Um, now, Doug Tallamy has a, a student that did a very good study that um, with the chickadee that you would only find chickadees in yards that had 70% or more natives. And um, this is a, a very nice study to cite. A real reason to plant natives is, is for the insects, for the, for the caterpillars, so that a bird species can breed. And how to find out more about native plants. The Florida Native Plant Society has um, a lot of resources on its website now. <clears throat> Excuse me, those are the, um, that's the state chapter. And of course you have your local chapters that have a lot of information for you. And National Audubon has a plants for birds effort and you can actually put in your zip code and, and get pull up plants that are suitable for your area that are good for birds. And Orange Audubon always has speakers on plants for birds. And, um, you know, we have a big effort on that. And we have had yard tours uh, twice. Um, that's in my yard. Um, but it, it, we've, it's been difficult. I, I think you guys have them down there, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And a lot of other chapters around the state do. It's just a lot of work to, to set up. Uh, we found that many of the homes that we would like to show off, either the people weren't really ready or that there were some invasives that weren't good examples. So, so um, at your home, you probably, when you first moved in, you probably had a lot of foundation plants, assuming that it was, it was an established home, not, not a new home. Foundation plants was the old style and the plants that were in horticulture and still are, are shiny leaved, waxy leaved, like camellias, pittosporums, viburnums. They have waxy cuticles and they've been selected for to not have insects feeding on them. 
like the uh, Confederate Jasmine or the shiny Ligustrum. These are no good for the caterpillars. Now, Ptolemy has a great tree list uh, in Bringing Nature Home, the first book. Um, and he ranks the species by how many species of caterpillars are on them. Um, but he's working out of um, University of Delaware about, a mile, about an hour south of Philadelphia. So this is tapered toward the Northeast and some of these we don't have. Um, but Orange Audubon made a, a flyer of, of ones appropriate for us, the bird and butterfly friendly plants for Central Florida. And if you get that name down and Google that, you should be able to get to this. Uh, we have it now online, but it was something that we traditionally gave out at, at festivals. Um, oh, th there should be some copies at Orlando Wetlands Park um, when you guys go on that field trip because uh, the, the Orange Audubon members who developed it, Mary Kime and Randy Snyder uh, are volunteers out there. Um, so here we've got black cherry. Oh, well, I'll go through these. And second page of this flyer is um, vines, flowers and ground covers and some plants to avoid. So this is something I, I, if you don't have a flyer like this, I encourage you to make one. All right, so now I'm gonna go through a very short list of, of top plants for birds uh, through via the caterpillars, plants for caterpillars for birds. Top of the list is oaks with uh, Ptolemy records 534 species of caterpillars on the oaks and all the oaks are good when they leaf out, whatever season that leafing out may be, they, they're gonna have caterpillars on them and birds. Um, we're looking up at the oaks. And Ptolemy's got a new book, The Nature of Oaks. I haven't read it yet, but I hope to soon. And I'm sure it's good. Oaks are very important in the whole Eastern North America. And there's of course species out West too. Next on his list is willows. And we look in the willows for the yellow warbler, um, which comes through in migration and also on a rare occasion stays for the winter. Um, of course, willows is not one that you would most, in most places would put in your yard. It needs wetland and it, it's quite aggressive. But one that you could put in your yard and should is wild cherries. And there are several species. The one that we're promoting the most is the wild black cherry, Prunus serotina. Um, it's got a little fruit that's sweet and a good size for a bird. And it's got lots of species of caterpillars. Now, one thing, a negative you might think is that it has Eastern tent caterpillars, but the yellow bill cuckoo eats tent caterpillars. And we always are thrilled to see the yellow bill cuckoo. So that may not be so bad. Another one I want to promote is sugarberry, Celtis levigata. And I first put sugarberry in my yard because I wanted to get these two beautiful butterflies, the hackberry emperor and the tawny emperor. Well, I never did see them in my yard and I have several sugarberries now, but um, I do see birds in the leaves and those are getting the small caterpillars that are on it. So it's a good one for that. Plus the little fruits are sweet and of a good size for birds. So sugarberry, you can't beat it. It's, it grows pretty fast. It's got that interesting bark straight up, goes straight up and uh, I'm plugging it for a street tree. When we go to the Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive, which um, Orange Audubon is very involved with, but I think your chapter must have visited as well. It's, it's a really good birding hotspot. The trees at the beginning are sugar berries, and that's where we look for the warblers and other songbirds. And then you got to have sable or cabbage palm, our state tree. One of the cool things that it has is the palm leaf skeletonizer on the bottom of the leaf that makes this frass in insect excrement. 
And it happens, and by the way, this is what the caterpillar looks like, and this is what the moth looks like. So this is, these are microlepidoptera, very small. And I'm sure you've seen this and start noticing on the undersides of the cabbage palm leaves. And the yellow-throated uh, warbler uh, likes this, these caterpillars under here. And you can very often find that warbler associated with palms. And also the sable palm uh, fruit is good for birds. You know, you, you've probably seen the robins come through and eat it, but other birds can eat it as well. And everybody knows American beauty berry is a shrub, is, is a great survival food and, and attractant to birds. So what we're fishing for is that there's these really two categories because look at the, the leaves are a little bit hairy. Uh, someone pointed out last time I gave this talk, they actually have repellent properties to insects. So the beauty berry is really not a, not a caterpillar host. It's, it's just a, a buried plant. So we've got these two categories. And I wanna point out that butterfly caterpillars that many of you grow, but you do butterfly gardening, that those are not optimal for birds. Maybe for a blue jay, but certainly not for the warblers. These protuberances are a hindrance to swallowing it. Plus they often have distasteful chemicals that come out uh, up here. And this is aposematic coloration telling the uh, uh, bird or predator on it that it's distasteful. So yes, it's a whole different thing uh, with the butterfly gardening than it is for this microlepidoptera for the birds. So what, I'm not gonna move this, okay. What are the best trees for microlepidopter caterpillars for Central Florida? Oaks, cherries, sugar, and, and I need to change that. It's not hackberries, hackberries grow farther north, but ours is the sugarberry and sable palm, okay? <clears throat> so I'm um, getting to the end of this. Um, so uh, Doug Tallamy is a professor and um, he's a rare professor in that he makes the bridge and writes these books and is on the lecture circuit. Um, and, and you know, his talks are accessible and very interesting to, to lay people, but he doesn't have time to do a website and a whole outreach campaign. Um, but he teamed up with a, someone who is set up this website called homegrownnationalpop.org. And what you're supposed to do is go to that and then put in your zip code and um, record your native plantings. And the idea is that we get more and more and uh, we can do this one person at a time, regenerate biodiversity. So let's see. Okay, and then this is the, about the talk on Thursday, Scott, Biden's all world on the wing. And other than that, I will open it up to questions. Very good. Excellent presentation. Thank you so very much. Yes, we, we're pushing our, our, we're giving away the free oaks. I think in our county, there's like 398 caterpillars found on the live oaks and just in our county. But wow. That's, good number. You'll have to send me that info. We'll have where you have that. Yeah, I will. Um, I'm looking forward to other talks. Uh, that's one of the reasons we need to educate people is that we're having a uh, native garden demonstration at the county commission, hoping that people that come to the county commission to pay their bills and things will walk through the uh, garden and, and maybe sit down and enjoy it. Uh, we have a little bench there too. And, and it was going to have some signs uh, trying to educate folks about the, the value of uh, native plants. Um, That's great. Well, does anybody have any questions ab about this? Um, Deborah, do you have any pamphlets uh, on why you should plant uh, native plants? Yes, you showed one. You know, I mean, you had the birds one, but. Yeah, um, no, not really. Other than that, 
I mean, our Native Plant Society takes care of that. Um, they have a pamphlet on why? I'm sure they do. Just go to the state chapter and drill okay. down. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> There's a question from Jane Shul. She would like to know more about the presentation later this week that you were talking about. Okay. Um, that Just go to YouTube, put in Orange Audubon Society, and it'll pop up at 7 on Thursday. Okay. And it's Scott Widensall, um, the Pulitzer Prize finalist for Living on the Wind back in 2000. You now has a new book and uh, a lot of technology has improved on tracing uh, migration and I, I'm, I'm, I'm about half done <laughs> with the book now before Thursday trying to read it. It's very dense and but beautifully written. He's, he's a wonderful writer and, and a good speaker. So we'd love to have you. Yeah, Bob, maybe we can send out a, a notice to our members too. Yep, we can include it with the uh, email tomorrow that we're sending Good. out to everybody. Good. Okay. Anything else you want, would like to know? Yeah, you had uh, one, you said something about the uh, one butterfly, but you didn't um, mention any um, other butterflies that you would want to encourage in your yards or something. Oh, like that. well, no, that's a whole nother thing. I mean, you can't go wrong with butterflies, but. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, and I presume there's many people who are into butterfly gardening and, you know, their books and butterflies, um, they have very distinctive uh, markings, the caterpillars and the, the books are available um, and online resources to identify them. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm attacking something that is much harder, the, the microlepidoptera, which don't have distinctive features some of them, and, and I was telling last time I gave this talk, uh, how would you go about doing a survey for the microlepidopter? Well, um, that book, um, Caterpillars of Eastern North America, uh, um, is a good resource, um, but basically you've got to rear them because, um, Unless there's something distinct. Oh, well, hey, one thing you could do is sort them by, narrow it down by the way they feed. Like some are going to be leaf rollers and some are going to be leaf miners in between the leaves and skeletonizers. And, and those categories will help you narrow it down possibly to the family of the microlepidoptera. But basically to get an actual identification, you've got to rear them out and send them to Gainesville to the Division of Plant Industry of Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. <laughs> and I did try to get my friend Julieta to engage the uh, lepidopterist to help on this kind of research, like which species of plant seem to have the most people, the most caterpillar, different kind of caterpillars people submit for identification. But the lepidopterist is busy and didn't want to really engage in that project. But Julieta, um, I'm, I'm going to try to get her to talk for the Native Plant Society. I don't know if she will or not. Um, uh, may, may have some good insights on, on this. And, and basically, um, I do it the opposite way without rearing them all out. And by the way, Doug Tallamy, he's a professor of entomology and he's doing that all the time and he loves doing that. Uh, so when he, you hear his talks, he shows you pictures of all the different caterpillars on the different plants, but that's what he does. And um, but what I'm doing is just kind of backwards. I'm just looking at the trees and seeing which ones the birds go to, and then assuming that those are uh, well. I'm I'm seeing little little caterpillars, in it, but I'm not worrying about identifying them. <laughs> Great uh, How many caterpillars. Have you had on your trees? What kind of caterpillars? No. Oh, yeah. How many different kinds? Have you counted them? No, <laughs> but sounds like uh, Richard has, and he's an entomologist that professionally, whereas I, I just studied it and then I went out of the field pretty early. Oh, <laughs> uh, there's another question. Uh, Jeannie Kant would like to know why you can't just send a photograph to Gainesville of the caterpillar. Oh, 
Well, that's an interesting thought. As a matter of fact, there's all these iNaturalist and, and these online resources, some bug bug ones too. Maybe, maybe it's easier now. Maybe I'm making art of, that it needs to be. But anyway, this is the way we, we used to have to do it. <laughs> yeah, it must be easier now. Try a photograph first. <laughs> Oh, very good. Uh, we appreciate you very much. Uh, and one of the things you have had so many good speakers too at Orange Audubon Society. Are are they available on your website? They are. Just go when you well, I'm going to go to Scott Widensall's talk. You can poke around and see the past ones. And we've actually sorted them into playlists, which are folders that make it easier to see what you want to see. And yes, we do have a lot of good, good pro programs. Uh, you know, COVID really changed things, but um, we've tried to make lemonade out of it with it in regard to our online programs. It's, it seems like you're having at least two a month, maybe three. Yeah, we're trying to have every Thursday, the bird chats, and then the program is a little bit shorter. And I, and I actually do want to, Bob Montanero, I'm hoping uh, you'll give us one at some point. Um, anyway, uh, and then the third Thursday is when we have our monthly program, like Scott Widensalls. Yeah. Well, if there's no, no other, I guess we'll end this and thank you so much for getting, being on. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, I enjoyed it. <laughs>